got a friend in me. You got a friend in me. Come on, let's wrangle up the cattle. When the road looks rough ahead and your miles and miles from your nice warm bed. Round them up, cowboy. Just remember what your old pal said. Boy, you got a friend in me. Some other folks might be a little bit smarter than I am. Big and stronger, too. Come on, Woody. Maybe, but none of them will ever love you the way I do. It's me and <laughs> you, boy. And as the years go by, <laughs> a friendship will never die. <laughs> you don't see it's our destiny. <laughs> you got a friend in me. Well, as uh, we move from the serious toy store business, toy story business of Team uh, Woody, Mr. Potato Head, and Buzz Lightyear, and that gang, think about um, the team that uh, Jesus assembled, called the apostles, those disciples that had been learners for those three years, and now were sent out, and. Um, we have a list of, of those, those apostles here, the 11, together uh, with, it's a, a reference with certain women, and, and it helps us to uh, realize a, a, a real radical thing among many radical uh, things that happened that made the church unfold, uh, not the least of which is this is the first time there was an egalitarian experience of men and women as leaders in faith communities. And uh, we see that story told in other parts of the New Testament where women were primary uh, formation of house churches, uh, leaders, and such. But the point, uh, of course, is this team that um, Jesus had. We think of them sometimes as uh, they're almost kind of mythic figures larger than life, but I don't know if you had a moment in the daily text this morning, it struck me during my devotion time uh, this morning that uh, it, it's also from the book of Acts, how the people who encountered these guys and these ladies, how they uh, regarded them, it says in Acts 4.13, now when the people saw the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and ordinary men. They were amazed and recognized them as companions of Jesus. These um, mythic figures in the life of the church that were the instruments by which all of the goodness that uh, people of faith have done throughout history, the, the famous peoples like uh, St. Francis and um, St. Clair and Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Oscar Romero and, and the everyday acts of people of faith that are part of the legacy of this church and the lives of people here. Uh, all of it is out of this group of friends who, um, who found themselves to be better together. Um, we imagined ourselves a little bit being among them uh, six weeks ago. I bet a number of us experienced the living last supper. It was a, a really beautiful Holy Thursday, Maundy Thursday, during Holy Week, uh, that group of guys, uh, mostly from atonement, came together and um, we imagined ourselves to be among the, among the 11 and the 12. Now, what's happening in this sermon series, this season of Easter, 
is an invitation for you and for me to imagine ourselves as one of the actors, uh, one of the people of the books, book of Acts today called and filled and motivated to be doing the actions that are the movement of Jesus. Uh, Jesus said to these 12 as he was preparing them, he said, you're my friends. Kind of like uh, Woody saying uh, to us, you're my favorite deputy. You're my friend and here's what I have equipped you and want you to do. I hope that you can pray this prayer today at some point. God, let me be one of your actors today. One of these people of the book of Acts. I'm ordinary, I'm common, but you give me a boldness. And uh, it's quite stirring to imagine that uh, people can be amazed by the movement of God through us. But that's exactly what happens. So pray uh, to be among, among them in this, in this way. Well, how, how does that prayer become fulfilled? It's really a down-to-earth experience. And I want to heighten our attention to this phrase that's in our scripture today, that these friends in Christ were on a Sabbath's journey, about a Sabbath day's journey, our scripture said this morning, and along the way, they were constantly devoting themselves to prayer. So this movement happened because of people who have a center in their life of being on a Sabbath's journey. It's a fulcrum of their existence. It's the foundation. And out of that journey, lives of devotion and prayer that the movement of Jesus happens. I got thinking about the Sabbath's journey. If you looked at the cover of the at one pages. You noticed in a couple of weeks we'll start that series on the Ten Commandments. This gift of God to order human life. This uh, way that God loves us with a foundation. And that first Sunday we'll begin thinking about the first three or four commandments. And um, I suspect a number of us remember the third commandment having memorized it at some point in our formation of faith. I know yesterday when I visited Margie Jernberg, she um, uh, is in the hospital and, and uh, doesn't want visitors because it's kind of a hard time in terms of being with people, but she lets me come and she lets Judy come and thank you for all the cards and letters that you've sent her. But we remembered what it is that, that the Sabbath is part of our life and she remembered that third commandment. How many of us remember? Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. We are to fear and love God so much so that we do not neglect God's word or the hearing of it, but gather for prayer and praise. It's... Um, it's a foundation for life that tells us how it happens that these actions unfolded. And yet we know today this center of life is further and further away from people. The sense of having a life ordered by the Sabbath. That we in our existence are on a Sabbath journey. How strange is that becoming for people? Think about uh, folks in our world and, and how our own circle of relationships to be on a Sabbath journey becoming stranger and stranger. I thought about that in, in looking at the most recent issue of a magazine called The Christian Century. I've been reading for the last 30 years or so, perusing and reading, and this month a, uh, an issue that has a, a, a feature article called Wedding Plans. 
but think first about the title of the journal, uh, uh, The Christian Century. This uh, journal for, for the church and for pastors is uh, over 130 years old. And uh, it came out in the years after the Civil War as the Christian Oracle, uh, the announcement of the words of, of, of the Christ ones. And then in the, in the years that followed, as they approached the next century, as the 19th century was giving way to the 20th century, it was a time of great buoyancy and confidence and you know, you think about all that has unfolded in the last 130 years technologically and culturally. Uh, the church was filled with confidence and hope and, and a belief that the 20th century really would be the Christian century. Uh, and, and, of course, now that century has come and gone. And here we are well into the 21st century and um, we think about a Christian century that came and went, and we know that uh, less and less people in our United States are deeply immersed in faith communities. We know that less and less people on the subject of this article are, um, are getting married, let alone having what the article talks about is uh, a church wedding. That's uh, when you get in there, it's church wedding question mark. And I read it with great interest because I think about a couple of things. We don't have very many wedding requests in our uh, experience as a church. Probably six or eight in the last uh, two years or a little more. But one thing is very common, which is talked about in the article and that is uh, in all of these wedding requests they come to us from people who are not part of the church and they come asking about having a church wedding and I have found the conversations with these families um, those that we've ended up celebrating weddings with and those that we haven't to be really illuminating and challenging and I know it's a, a conversation that needs to happen but it's um, it's fascinating and difficult and and uh, this article gets into it 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 tells a story very much like what happens in my conversations with people who come here not part of the community I, I try to welcome them as warmly and as as enthusiastically as possible. You don't have to be a member to have a wedding, but it will take some time to prepare a church wedding, I describe. And, um, and in the article, the exact same thing unfolds. This pastor tells about a, a couple coming for a, a church wedding, and when he sat down to talk with them about what that would be like, uh, he found they really didn't have a, a grasp and how he was willing to help them understand and spend time with them and, um, and offered a schedule of how he could help them prepare a church wedding. And, and he found that there was very little interest in spending that time. And in fact, as he probed a little deeper, he discovered that it was really the couple's family members that wanted them to have a church wedding. And... Um, and this couple wasn't interested in spending that time. And so they went elsewhere for their wedding. And uh, some of the people in the church who heard about that uh, became angry and accused the pastor of denying that couple a church wedding when in fact he had offered them one. It's a, it is a difficult uh, process to walk through, but one that is worthy of the care and the prayer and the love and the energy to think about how we uh, are formed in our life together. 
think about um, the movement of God creating people that are better together. It's something that I'm excited to, to have with people. I, I think about these families more recently that have asked about baptism in our church. And it's very much a similar conversation because we've had four or five inquiries about baptism and not all, all from families that are not involved. And again, excitement and enthusiasm, desire to celebrate baptism, but this will take some time to prepare. And um, I'm really enthused. Next Sunday, I've got a, a couple of families that have committed to being in a, a group with me uh, to spend that, that time uh, I've got a couple of other families that are more seasoned participants in faith communities who are willing to come just out of the hope that they might help these newcomers feel welcome and, and feel like they can fit in. Uh, truth to tell, when I think about my rhythm of life and the rhythm of my week, my Sabbath journey that's my life, Adding another thing to do on Sunday afternoon is not my first idea. It's going to cut directly into the rhythm of my Sabbath in the afternoon, which is, Pastor takes a nap now. <laughs> but I could not be more excited about this because I know what happens when we dwell together in the Word. I've seen it, I've felt it, I've watched it, and it's where the Holy Spirit works to do things like helping couples that want to prepare for a life together to discover a value such as each for the other and both for Christ. It's a, a time where families, parents, and children discover what it means when the word says, I will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents. The beauty of this word that reminds us that in God we are better together in this larger community, no longer simply city or suburb or segregated and divided peoples, but together in one creator, one life giver, who does amazing things when we come together. In this world, better together. Is anyone else praying for Israel and Palestine this weekend? It's a historic moment. The two political organizations of the Palestinian people, Hamas and the old PLO, now called Fatah, have announced that they're joining together. And this has frightened the people of Israel a great deal because Hamas has existed with one purpose over the last number of decades, to destroy Israel. And Fatah has been far more moderate even in acknowledging Israel's right to exist. And now Hamas is declaring their willingness to accept Israel's right to exist, but Israel is frightened by this coming together. We have to keep praying because this is what God's Spirit does. It makes us better together. We find our our journey, our Sabbath journey, ordering us by prayer, being a team, Jesus' team. Where does it all lead? Well, I guess kind of like Team Woody in Buzz Lightyear, Mr. Potato Head, to infinity, or we might say to eternity and beyond. All right, then I will. Stand back, everyone. To infinity and beyond!
Cat.